Good morning. How are we doing? It is so amazing to get to be here today. Um, as most of you already heard, I'm the campus pastor at our Hillsdale campus, and things there are going awesome, by the way. Um, and so I've been to the Edgerton campus, and I'm obviously at the Hillsdale campus now, but to get to be here, this is my first time being here on a Sunday morning, so it's awesome. Um, your campus pastor, Jason, has hyped you guys up, and you have lived up to the hype. So it is just awesome to get to be here with you all today, and happy Mother's Day to all the mamas. Um, she's right over there. My wife and kids are over there. Everyone clap for my wife and kids, come on. They're the real MVPs, let's be honest. Um, I came across, in preparation for today's message, I came across probably one of the most adorable social experiments that I've ever found. Um, and what they did was they, they selected a group of children. They looked like they were ages like maybe four to six, somewhere in that range. And they led them into a room one by one. And in the room was a table with a plate on the, on the table and a marshmallow on the plate. And they would lead the children in and like let them sit at the table. So they're kind of like literally eye level with that marshmallow. And the adult would say, okay, so listen, here's this marshmallow you can eat it right now if you want to, but I would encourage you to not do that because I'm going to go out from this room, and when I come back, if you haven't eaten that, um, that marshmallow, I'll give you another one. So the adult leaves the room, and the camera kind of zooms in on these little kids' faces, and hilarity ensues. Like, they're just staring at it. And then they kind of like, there's one kid that kind of uh, nah, like makes chomping faces towards it. And some kids kind of reach out and just poke it just a little bit. And then like you got your kids that slide the plate over and they're smelling the marshmallow. And, and some of them, like the one kid starts licking it. And you're like, what are you, the weird kid licking the marshmallow, you know? Um, there was one little girl that was adorable that as the adult was giving the instructions, she straight like mouthful, um, blah, like just eating the marshmallow while the adult's talking. Like that would so be most of us in this room probably. Uh, but it's this really cute thing. And a lot of kids, they, they did not eat the marshmallow, but you could see the tension on them. They're squirming in their chairs and they're just having the worst time ever because they want to eat this marshmallow. But they know, man, if I don't, eat that, something better is coming. And in a much less adorable way, it kind of reminds me of the situation that we find ourselves in probably every day. Um, only for us, it's not a marshmallow on a plate that we're struggling not to eat. If we're being really honest with ourselves and with each other, um, we're probably looking down the barrel of a sin issue or multiple sin issues that quite frankly are looking to destroy you. They're looking to destroy you spiritually and emotionally, maybe physically. Um, and in all ways, these sins are going to destroy us and we know it. And we're sitting there just like, oh man, what do I do about this temptation that's right in front of me? Some of you... Literally today, you realize, man, for me, it's going to cost me everything. Maybe you have a coworker that's been giving you more attention than your spouse has. They're making you feel special, and you're like, man, I don't get that kind of attention at home. This feels really good, and it feels really nice. And in your mind, you're thinking like, man, do I take, do I take that next step? And for you, you've got to understand, like, that is going to destroy you. That's going to destroy your family. For some of you, you know and understand, like, I have that app on my phone, or I have those pop-ups that pop up, and I can't help but click those, even though I know right where they're going to take me, I just can't seem to get myself out of that. And I'm here to tell you today, that is going to cost you everything. Maybe in your job situation, you've been just kind of, whoop, skimming a little off the top, and no one's really noticed, and in the back of your mind, you're like, oh my gosh, like that, that, that feeling of tension is in you, like they're going to catch me, they're going to find out one day, no, 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 we're good, we're good. But you can't just, you can't stop, you just keep doing that. That's going to destroy you. For some of us in this room, it's very real, it's, it's alcohol, it's drugs, it's, it's that addiction, and you know all too well 
the destruction that that brings in your life and the lives of the people around you. And we spend a considerable amount of time and energy and effort and resources trying to figure out the quickest and the easiest way for us to get back to our sin of choice. Like we're in this life hack series and a lot of us, we've got life hacks on how to get exactly what we want even though it's killing us inside. Today we're going to talk about temptation. And I want to really talk about, man, how, how can we change things? How can we be equipped to avoid the same pitfalls that we've fallen in, maybe even since we were a young teenager? How can we undo these things? Well, first off, I want to start by defining some terms. Let's, let's make sure we know and understand what we're talking about here. When we're talking about the idea of temptation, we all need to be on the same page. So I've included a definition of temptation here. It says temptation is something you want to have or to do, even though you know you shouldn't. That bag of peanut butter cups on top of your fridge might be an example of temptation. Come on, let's, let's be serious here. Is there a more perfect combination than the amount of chocolate and the amount of peanut butter that Reese's has married together to make Reese's peanut butter cups? There's nothing better. If you disagree with me, you're wrong. Like, that's just straight up. Like, I love you, but you're wrong. And we understand, like, that bag of Reese's on the fridge when we walk by, you, wait, what? I hear it calling out to me. It knows my name. And you can swear, man, as I walk, I, I, I don't know. I think I can smell them. Like the bag's not even open yet, but I have some supernatural gift of smell right now that I can smell those Reese cups. It's that drive, that temptation, that desire to get to it. Um, a, another one, a different, de, so a bit, 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 a definitions, that's a hard word to say, of temptation. Number one, the act of influencing by exciting hope or desire. The desire to have or do something that you know you should avoid. And number three, the one that I think really pertains to a lot of us, something that seduces or has the quality to seduce. It's something that's salacious. It's something that you want really, really bad, but you know you're not supposed to have it, or you're allowed to have it, but you need to keep it in moderation. But for us, we're like, man, I, I just don't really want to do that. I'm not real interested in, in taking on the moderation aspect of life. And we find ourselves asking the question, why would God tempt us? Why, God? Why, why are you going to tempt us? Like, it doesn't really seem fair, does it? Like, he's the God of the universe, and he, he loves us, according to his word. It says that he loves us, so why would he tempt us in this way. Um, so parents uh, of kids, I want to talk to you for a second. Um, <clears throat> we have three kids. They're all three um, college age. And um, when they were like young and teens and growing up, we had some pretty strict boundaries as far as like dating stuff goes. Like you can have a boyfriend or girlfriend at a certain age, but there are certain limitations you have. Like you're not going to go chill with your boyfriend or girlfriend alone in your bedroom one-on-one -on -one, um, because like bad things happen. We understand that. Like we don't want to put our kids in that position and we want our kids to stay vertical with their boyfriends or girlfriends, never horizontal because again, bad things happen. And um, with social media and phones and all of those things, we, we really stressed boundaries to our kids because we love them. We didn't want them to be tempted and we didn't want to be on the end of being the ones putting them into those situations where they're being tempted. So again, doesn't that kind of shed light then a little bit on like, okay, so God, why are you tempting us? Why are you putting us in these positions where we are being tempted? Well, I think we need to go straight to scripture for clarity. And in James chapter one, verses 12 through 15, it says, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. <clears throat> Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong. And he never tempts anyone else. 
Temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So you appreciate and understand, like, fundamentally there's a flaw in my question. Because no, God does not tempt us. That is not the situation here. As a matter of fact, when it comes to temptation, the Bible makes it clear, I believe, that we have two tempters specifically that come knocking at our door trying to sell their goods. The first one is the enemy. The Bible says very clearly that we have an enemy. And the enemy has studied you and he knows you. I assume he's got a case file this thick on every person in this room. And he knows how to break you down. I mean, he has studied you, he's watched you, and that's what he's trying to do directly or indirectly. We have an enemy that is trying to trip us up and make us fall flat on our face. The second tempter is you. It's you. We tempt ourselves. The Bible talks about in depth how wicked our hearts are and how they're so prone to darkness, and how they're so prone to being attracted to the things that we know we're not supposed to have. And time after time after time, I don't know about you, but for me, I've been in the throes of temptation, and I've started rebuking the devil, like, dude, you get out of here, you leave me alone. Go back to hell or wherever you're supposed to be, like, just leave me alone. Jesus, help me out of this. Like, get him off my back. And I feel like in the middle of that, (laughs) the enemy's like, That's all you. I'm not even doing anything. You know what I'm saying? Like he's got us so down that if he's not tempting us, we're tempting ourselves. So we've got to have a different vantage point when it comes to the idea of temptation. We've got to have a better understanding. If we're going to see victory in our lives, and I believe that Christ wants to see victory in our lives, we've got to see clearly. God wants us faithful. God wants us winning. And, and, and I need to clarify, we're not talking winning in the world's terms. We're not talking a big bank account and an awesome car and a great job necessarily. We're talking not falling into the same pitfalls that we keep falling into and have been falling into for the last 20 years of our lives. It's so important that we seek freedom in these areas. So I think it begs the question, when I'm tempted, have I already messed up? Am I too far gone? When I'm tempted, have I already messed up? And my answer to that, quite honestly, is maybe. I don't know, maybe. I would encourage you to check your surroundings. Have you put yourself in a situation where you're about to lose? See, because we get this mentality where we kind of tiptoe up the sin a little bit, and like, oh, there it is, look at it. And we kind of get closer to it, and like, I'm I'm safe. And we get closer to it, and you're like, no, I'm, I'm good. N- nothing, nothing bad. And then the next thing you know, you fall right into it. You're like, boy, I didn't even see that coming. How did that happen? Like, come on, man. We've got to stay away from it. So if you're flirting with that boundary, if you're pushing that limit, then yeah, you're in error, and you're probably going to end up falling. Craig Groeschel, which is a familiar name to a lot of you, um, he's an author, um, pastor of uh, Life Church, awesome dude. Um, I just now bought one of his books from this day forward, which if you're married or going to get married, get that book and read it. It's killer. So I'm listening to, um, I'm listening to his book as I'm driving and, um, he tells this story. If you know Craig Rochelle, the dude's jacked. It's kind of annoying. He's like the buffest pastor in the face of the planet and he's got perfect (laughs) teeth and perfect hair and, oh, Craig. Um, but I'm not jealous, I promise. But, um, yeah, it's, it's bad. Um, but, but Craig in this book is talking about how for him, he's like, I never miss a day of flossing. So he says, I never miss a day of flossing. And as I'm listening to him, I'm like, dude cares an awful lot about oral hygiene. Like praise Jesus. That's wonderful. But he goes on to say, like, if he misses flossing, that kind of throws him off his routine. And he's like, you know what? That day, if I miss flossing, I'm like, you know what? I don't need to work out today. I worked out last, like yesterday. I'm good. So I may skip a day of working out. And then if I go to the office and there's donuts there, he says, I don't just eat one, I finish the box off. And the next thing I know, it's a couple days later, and one of my coworkers comes up and says, bro, you look like you're putting on a couple LBs. And then I punch him in the nose. And then he calls the cops, and it leads on a high-speed chase. Like, he goes on and on and on and on, 
kind of to a comical degree, hopefully. But you start looking at it, you're like, wait a minute, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? One step out of our normal area of life, just one step, is all it takes to throw everything else off course. So when it comes to sin, when it comes to temptation, we've got to understand, taking one step towards that sin, even taking a little tiny baby half step, sometimes even looking in the direction of your sin, and you're going to end up right back in it. So if you're feeling tempted, have you sinned? No, I don't think so. I don't think temptation equals sin. It's the bait, not the bite. Now we have to understand the enemy is a master angler. Like he knows the exact bait to choose for you and he casts and he sets that hook and then the next thing you know, we are done. But we need to get to a place in our lives where we're like, you know what, I'm not gonna swim there anymore. I'm tired of swimming in those same waters because I know the same thing's gonna happen to me over and over and over again. So the best thing to do, stop swimming there. Get out of the water. Go swim somewhere else. I, I came across an illustration I, I feel like I have to share, and it's from the great theologian, SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> so when our kids were really little, we didn't let our kids watch SpongeBob, but then when they got older, we watched it with them and laughed alongside. So if you need to judge me on that, by all means, go ahead. Um, but there's an episode of SpongeBob where he and his best friend Patrick, who's the starfish, are, um, <clears throat> Patrick's like, I gotta show you something, and they go running out somewhere, and um, next thing you know, they're in this area where there's all these hooks hanging down in the water, and Patrick's like, whoa, it's a carnival, and like, he's going, he's like, they got free cheese, and he takes the cheese off a hook, and he eats it, and like, Patrick, or SpongeBob's like, no, 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 you can't do that, you can't do that, you gotta stay away from that, that's dangerous, and, and basically, Patrick's like, no, this is awesome, I'm having a blast, and the next thing you know, the hook kind of hooks Patrick's, he's wearing swim trunks for whatever reason. They, they hook his swim trunks and he starts to be reeled in. He starts to go up and SpongeBob's like, no. And the next thing you know, you see Patrick floating back down. <laughs> that was awesome, whatever. Like best time ever. So all of a sudden SpongeBob's like, you know what? He's out there eating cheese off the hooks and having fun. So SpongeBob just starts having fun with it and he gets hooked and reeling him up, and he can't get off. And it stops being a cartoon, and it shows a fisherman pull a real sponge out of the ocean, which is just great writing. Like, that's hilarious. But I'm sitting there watching that, and I'm like, I don't know that the, that the writers of SpongeBob meant to, but man, they're sharing some deep theology in this kid's cartoon. Because that's exactly the way that it is. We go walking in areas we have no business walking into with friends that we have no business following. And for you, your friends may put the hook right in their mouth and eat the cheese off of it and just have the best time of their whole life, and they may walk away consequence-free. But for you, you may walk up and one time you're done. Dude, I've seen it time and time and time again. That's just the way that it happens. Why? I don't know. But it seems like we see so many people around us just having the best time living the most broken lifestyles imaginable. And there's a sinful part of us that wants that so desperately. Like, man, that looks like so much fun. Until they sink the hook. Until you're being taken to a place that you do not want to go to. We've got to understand. We need to avoid the hooks in our lives. And a lot of you have been alive long enough, man, you know the hook. You know the area of your life where if you start wandering down that same road, the whole idea of play stupid games, win stupid prizes, you know. But we keep walking right back into it over and over and over again. One of the things that's given me a great deal of peace in my mind is to remember that Jesus himself was tempted like, think about that for a second. Jesus himself was tempted. We appreciate he came down to earth and he lived as fully God and fully man in the flesh. It was unbelievable. He did it, of course, flawlessly. He never fell into sin. But I believe that Jesus faced the vast majority of any sin that we could ever imagine. And he came out of it unscathed. But he wasn't immune to temptation. 
Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. I'm not going to go through and read the whole thing. If you want to, get your phone out, take a picture of that, or jot it down. Go read it later, because it's, it's amazing. But basically, in this text, <clears throat> we appreciate that Jesus has been fasting for 40 days and for 40 nights. He's out in the wilderness, and um, you, can, you can understand, after that much fasting, you're going to feel pretty weak right? You're going to feel pretty broken down physically, maybe even like spiritually, emotionally, all the things. I imagine Jesus was very hangry after 40 days of fasting and instantly, boop, the enemy shows up and he goes over to Jesus and I'm going to give you the roar paraphrase here. He's basically like, hey, Jesus, I bet you're real hungry. Why don't you turn these rocks right here into delicious bread and eat it? Because that would make you feel better. And Jesus actually quotes scripture in that moment. He's like, no, 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 that, that's not what my father wants me to do. That's not what I'm going to do. So then this text says that then the devil takes him up um, to the top in, in Jerusalem and says, hey, man, jump off of this building. I know it sounds weird, Jesus, but just like jump off. You're going to be fine. You can call on some angels. They, your little heel won't even hit the side of the bit. You'll be fine. Just, just try it, Jesus. It'll be fun. And actually in this moment, in this test, Believe it or not, Satan actually quotes scripture to Jesus. Are you allowed to do that? I mean, I, I guess. But Jesus combats him again with, nope, absolutely not, and throws scripture back at him. And in the final of the three temptations, the devil takes him up to the highest peak and says, Jesus, look at everything around you. It all belongs to me. All you have to do is just bow, just bow down to me. Just bow down, it'll be fine. And I'll give it all to you. And Jesus quotes scripture again and is like, I need you to take off now. And it says the temptation is over. But I think it's worth noting for us that every single time Jesus was tempted, what did he do? Scripture, exactly. He went to God's word. And he flawlessly wins this battle that like some of us, honestly, man, that would be so difficult to be in that. But we've got to learn to equip ourselves just as Christ did to be able to withstand the temptations when they come because the temptations will come. If the enemy's going to get up in Jesus' face and tempt him, is there some world that he's not going to do the same thing to you? Think about that for a second. He actually had the audacity to step up in the face of the Son of God and try to tempt him. Dude, he's going to tempt us all day long if he's going to have that kind of audacity. The next portion of what I want to talk about is sharing is caring. My friends, we're in this together. Those of us that live under the banner of Jesus Christ, those of us that call Jesus our Lord, we're in this together. We're the same team, same goal, same God. One of the fun things for me getting to be here today is I was at the Edgerton campus. I was campus pastor there. And then I went up to Hillsdale. I'm the campus pastor there. I've never been here before. I was here on a Wednesday night several years ago to teach to students, which was really cool. But like I get to see a third of my family that I've never met before. But my point is coming into this, I'm like, you guys are my family. Like this is amazing. We're one church, three locations. Like we're all in this together, my friends. And other churches, the church down the road, the church across the street, those that are calling and, and saying, man, we, we're living for Jesus. You know what? Same team. We've got to start to understand this. We have got to be on watch with and for one another. Straight up. We have a duty to be on watch with and for one another. We can't fall asleep. We can't fall asleep on each other. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 2 say, Dear brothers and sisters, if any other, I'm sorry, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same, same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. Dude, straight up, if we see each other struggling in sin, we have an obligation. We have a duty to go talk to each other and gently and lovingly help each other back out of the ditch. But we got to be real careful not to get pulled down into it, right? we got to be real careful not to fall into it ourselves. You notice we're not called to burn each other's houses down. We're not called to go to social media and go, oh, Mr. Holy Jason Boer did it. Oh, look at what he did. You know? That's what we're not called to do. 
We're called to be looking out for each other as a brother and sister in Christ and go, hey, man, I'm just concerned for you. Are you okay? Like, hey, I, I saw this in your life, dude, and like for a follower of Jesus, there's no room for that. We get to share in each other's burdens, but that doesn't happen if we don't just love each other. Now, there may be people in this building right now that you can't stand. You look across the aisle and you're like, dude, I've known that dude for 20 years and he drove me nuts 20 years ago and he's still driving me nuts today. That's awesome. We don't all have to be BFFs, but we got to love each other. We're all part of the same family, same team, same God. We got to look out for each other. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about three underappreciated tactics when it comes to fighting temptation. Because I think a lot of times, honestly, we go into these situations and we're not equipped. We're not ready. Maybe we haven't even thought about it. And then we're in the middle of temptation. We're like, huh, that's weird. Why am I going the way of temptation? This is because we haven't pre-planned. We haven't thought about it. We haven't made any preparations. So number one, stay biblically grounded and prayed up. Now I know this is the super churchy answer. Stay prayed up. Read your Bibles. Like, I know that, like, everyone's rolling their eyes hard right now. Like, oh, the pastor's telling me to read my Bible. Pray. But come on, man. Seriously, this is bread and butter right here. This is literal nourishment. This is strength for us. This is our ability to be able to go on. Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through uh, 13 say, And so I tell you, keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find it. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So let me just tell you, in case you don't know this, God loves you more than you will ever be able to comprehend. Like when you start thinking about how much God loves you, if you have an amount in your mind, I guarantee it's not even scratching the surface. Like God loves you way more than, than you're ever able to understand. Praise him for that. But I believe if you have a sin issue in your life, if you have something that's just been dominating you, been eating your lunch for a long time, I full on believe if you're chasing after God, asking him to take that from you, surrounding yourself with people that are going to root you on and going to scripture and praying, dude, I guarantee you're going to beat those odds. You will. Not on your strength. Your strength, honestly, like love you, it's just not going to get you there. It's got to be on his strength. But in order to do that, we got to stay in the Word. we got to stay biblically grounded. We have to be talking to God on a regular basis. Not just calling out to Him when we're in danger or when we've messed up. But literally, good times, bad times, and everything in between, talking to God and having a relationship with Him. Number two, stay in community. It's so important that we stay in community together. Did you ever notice that the areas where you've struggled the most with sin in your life, have you ever noticed that you've withdrawn? It's like what we do as humans. When we're in the sauce and we're making bad decisions and we're going down that path, we tend to kind of step back from other believers and kind of just go off on our own, don't we? We kind of slink back into the darkness a little bit and kind of let, oh, no, no, go ahead, I'm fine, go on without me. Man, seriously, when we are alone like that, when we're isolated, we are so easy to pick off. We've got to stay in community together. We need to stay in the light that a community offers. 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses all us all from sin. One thing I love about this church, like our, our slogan, our tag, is we're a church that's raw, real, and loves you where you are. And the reality is that that's true. Like my experience, this church is very much that way. But the beautiful thing is we're raw, we're real, we love you right where, we are, right where you are, but we love you so much we don't want to leave you there. Does that make sense? We want to say, you know what, Let, like, I want to put my arm around you and I want us to take some steps toward Jesus. 
And every single one of you in here, I don't care if you've been a Christian since your first breath here on earth, which I don't even know how it's possible, but let's say you are, I believe every single one of us still has steps we need to take towards Jesus. We still have things that we need to lay at his feet and walk away from. Every single one of us. Buddy, there's no one in here better than anyone else. We're, we're all in this together. So if we want to start seeing some victory in our lives when it comes to the sin issues that keep dominating us, we've got to stay in community. We need each other. You need me and I need you. We've got to continue to arm in arm. Let's go. Because that way, if one of us falls flat on our face, you know what? There's somebody right there to go, come on, come on, get up. Dust off, let's go. We're, we're going to keep moving here. We've got to keep moving here. Let's go. Man, the joy of being able to be in authentic community together is a complete game changer. And a lot of people don't understand that. Or a lot of people are like, oh, I don't need community. I'm fine on my own, whatever. Like, dude, it's just not the case. We were, we were built for, we were made for community with one another around Christ. Number three on our list, <clears throat> the best chance we have to win against temptation is to turn your back and run. Turn your back and run. It sounds so counterintuitive, doesn't it? Almost ridiculous. Like in today's world, turn your back and run. No. I'm, I'm going to puff up. I'm gonna, come on, bro. Let's go. Let's face on. Let's go. Like man up, whatever. Like we think, no, I'm going to stand up to every challenge in my life and I'm going to stare it right down and I'm going to win. And you're going to fall right back into it. Because some things we have to have a better understanding of than this. Now, there are times we're called to stand up and face those obstacles. There are times where the Holy Spirit will ask you to surround yourself with other people, and you're going to hunker down with this team and go, okay, guys, let's go. We're going to stand. Come on, let's go. We're going to stand up to this. We're going we're gonna to make it through this. There are those times that that happens. But in the other times, get up, turn your back, and run from temptation. Because see, again, like I said, we kind of flirt with it a little bit, don't we? We see it over there and we're like, oh, it's cute. It's kind of looking at me. Hey, like we, we think it's kind of fun and we, we kind of just, you know, sidle up a little bit closer to it. No, I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not in, am I in sin? I'm not in sin right now. But like we keep kind of going over towards it closer and closer and closer. And you may even have brothers and sisters in Christ that are going, hey, what are you doing? Back away. Come on, man. What are you doing? But man, it's so important that we just turn our back and run. And uh, probably the best example of this in all of Scripture is in Genesis 39, verses 6 through 12. Um, I'm going to give the roar paraphrase to this one too, um, but please read it later. This story is about Joseph. Joseph is the guy that's born. He's got a bunch of brothers. Um, he's dad's favorite. Dad gives him the really cool coat with all the colors on it. Remember that story? Yep. And the brothers all hate him, and they're super jealous, and they're like, Psh, Joseph's a jerk. He doesn't even deserve that. And they all like go out one day into the forest, wilderness, whatever, and they're like, uh-oh, there's a hole there. And they knock Joseph down into the hole, and they get the coat, and they put some blood on it. And they get the great idea, like, oh, hey, look, there's some sl hey, slave traders, come here, I got my... And they sell their brother into slavery. And they go back, and they're like, this bloody coat, and they're like, dad, man, Joseph got eaten by a llama or whatever. And like, dad's real sad, because he was his favorite. And, um, but the Bible says something very interesting about Joseph. The Bible says that God poured his favor out on Joseph. Like, everything Joseph put his hand to, God prospered. And so Joseph is sold into slavery, which you can imagine, mm, slavery, that sounds like fun, especially back in, like, around Egypt, and, like, that's just bad news. He's sold into slavery, and God basically works him up through the ranks to where he is the highest servant in Potiphar's home. Potiphar is this, like, um, Egyptian dude that just wields a ton of power, and basically, in essence, Potiphar tells Joseph, like, hey, man, you have access to anything in this kingdom except for my wife. Like, bro code, you know, like, stay away from my lady. And it's like, okay, cool. And Joseph is just killing it. He's, he's out there doing his thing. 
Well, Potiphar's wife, evidently Joseph had the same, one of the same attributes that, that Pastor Brock has. The Bible says he was very handsome. The other service laughed at me too, you bunch of jerks. Um, remember, it's not a lie if I believe it. Um, but Potiphar's wife starts coming on to Joseph. Like, I think with some regularity, like, hey, whatever. And Joseph's like, absolutely not. That would dishonor my God and that would dishonor my master. So I'm out. You know, and he kind of tried to skirt around or whatever. And one time um, in, in this text, it says that she comes up and she literally grabs him by the cloak and she says, come to bed with me. Now, back like historically, judging in Egypt around that time, the cloak would have been kind of the only thing a dude was wearing. So she grabbed the cloak and the Bible says that he basically like skirt, like twists out of it and he runs out of the house and she's left just hanging his cloak. So like in between the lines, if we're reading, Joseph ran out of the house naked. He ran out of the house buck naked to avoid sin because he didn't want to dishonor God and he didn't want to dishonor Potiphar. Like in the world's eyes, how crazy is this? Potiphar's wife is probably beautiful. She probably was like, keep it on the down low. Like nobody had to know about it. But Joseph has those pesky values of don't want to dishonor God. And he looks like an idiot running down the street with no clothes on, just straight running. And I look at that and say, that's exactly what some of us need to do today. We need to put our track shoes on and we need to turn our back and we need to run. And not just aimlessly, I'm just out for a jog, running around. I'm talking running right to Jesus. If you're out just for a jog, you're going to find your way back to it. But if you run to Christ and go, I am sick of this, Lord. I need you to take it from me. I believe he's good on it. And I believe that if you set yourself up for success in those things and you submit to him, man, you're going to see so much victory in your life. It's going to be overwhelming. All glory to him. Now, I got to be straight. I appreciate this isn't manly. It's not the most manly thing in the world to run away from something. It's not the most manly thing to go, beautiful woman, nope, absolutely not, yoinks, and run away. Like, that's not the most like, yeah, you're the man, good job, bro. But when it comes to honoring God, dude, that's all that has to enter our mind. Dude, let's honor God. See, because so many of us, we bring temptation and sin, we bring it home with us. It's, it's like a little puppy that we've picked up. It's a cute little puppy. And at the dinner table, the little puppy's just living under the table. And we're, we're feeding him right from our plate. And he's a nice little pet him, a little food. It's nice. But this puppy, it continues to grow and grow and grow. And all of a sudden, you look around and you realize that because of the sin and the temptation that you've been feeding under the table, you're the only one sitting at this table now. All the people that love you and want to do life with you, you've pushed them all away. You've excommunicated every single one of them for that sin, for that temptation. And all of a sudden, as you're feeding them, you notice, oh man, he bit me. What in the world? Because you think, at at like a, a level, we think we can control it. We're good. I brought it home. It trusts me. I feed it. We're good. But it will eat you alive we've got to stop feeding it under the table we've got to call these things into the light and start to understand what we were truly created for and what the expectations are that god has put on us for our lives because you know what that sin will do you know what that temptation will do it will drag you away and consume you you remember the james text where it says that at the end what's the end result it gives birth to death that's the stake of what we're talking about here that it will give birth to death in your life death to relationships death to your soul death to the people around you like seriously we've got to be so careful with these things we've got to submit to god so some of you today you need to go home and delete that app maybe it's instagram for you maybe you're kind of just scrolling on instagram oh oh hey and then that leads you down a road you have no business being down, just delete Instagram. Is it really worth it? Think about it. Is it really, it's not worth it. Just delete it. Get rid of it. Some of you need to go home and burn that little black book. The younger people in the room are like, what's a little black book? But you older people, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you need to get rid of that today. 
Some of you, you need to end conversations. The, the little Facebook conversation that started off just like, oh, high school uh, person I haven't seen in 25 years. They're still looking good. Hey. And it's kind of been going back and forth a little bit. And you know it's kind of getting to a place where like you're, you're dangerous. You're swimming with the hooks again. Some of you need to go home and delete and block and have a conversation with your spouse and ask for repentance. Some of you need to go home today and take the lid off of the bottle and just dump it down the sink. Or the, the drugs that you have, you need to flush them. I don't think you're supposed to flush them anymore. You just get rid of them. However responsibly you get rid of drugs, get rid of them. I don't even know what that looks like. But man, it is so worth it. It's so worth it not to continue to get dragged down by the same sin over and over and over again. God wants you living a life of freedom, my friend. He really does. And when you're enjoying your life of freedom, he wants you looking around for your brothers and sisters like, hey, I've been where you are, man. I can help you out. Come on, let's pray through this. I, I'm, I'm here for some accountability for you because I've been where you are before. Sin and temptation will take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. And it'll cost you more than you want to pay. Let's live different. Let's pray.